Good morning, everyone. Hello and welcome to this session. My name is Nabila Bodeman. I'm head of stewardship for social issues and human rights at the PRI. It's great to see so many of you in the room today. So this session is entitled Measuring What Matters, Assessing Stewardship on Human Rights Through Advance and Beyond. So last PR in person, some of you might remember that we launched Advance. We've since kicked off activities and it's great to see so many of the participants both on the panel and in the room. We've also been working hard with the advisory groups in putting together the Advance Assessment Framework, which is a document that we will use to help us track progress of the initiative. And it's really trying to assess progress on the initiative and assess whether the action that we're taking is really helping us in meeting the objectives that we set. And this brings, as you may imagine, a lot of questions that I can imagine some of you may be grappling with as well. And to help us kind of explore these questions, we have a full agenda today. So we will have a panel uh, of distinguished panelists here that will be moderated by Sophie, to whom I will hand over in a minute. And then we will go into a brief presentation at the end to introduce the advanced assessment framework. You will have the opportunity to ask questions to the panel, but I will let Sophie, uh, yeah, start. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Can everyone hear me? I'm having lots no. of fun with the mic. Okay, good. No, there's no, no. no. Oh. Uh, is it working? I'm. Is it working now? Are we good? Yeah. Any better? No. I can't even find it on my face. Are we all right? Is it... <laughs> Sorry, I'm. Is that okay? Or we might need a roving mic if it's not. Yeah, we're good. Okay, right. As Amelia said, I'm Sophie Robinson Tillett. I'm a sustainable finance journalist and a founder of Real Economy Progress and Complete Tech Phobe, as you can see. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I am very pleased to be here because. Uh, when we talk about sustainable finance, we so often really just <coughs> mean net zero and climate mitigation. But as important as that is, um, there's an awful lot more that, that we need to talk about. And human rights is obviously a core part of a transition to a more sustainable economy. Thank you. Um, and it's obviously, it's also a, a growing risk for investors, both from a reputational perspective, but also from a sort of regulatory and legislative one. Now, this is not going to be a panel on EU regulation, but I think it is worth just mentioning that there are a couple of things being driven forward, particularly in Europe, that are, that are intended to make human rights considerations a real headache for investors if they're not addressing them properly. Probably the most important one, and I know some of our panelists are probably grappling with some of this and, and also uh, uh, looking at what's coming through, but there's a, a, a rule called the Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive, which is being negotiated with. If it comes through at its height will mean any investor and company with significant operations in the EU will be held legally accountable for human rights abuses. And it's just one example of the ways in which this is becoming a greater risk for, for investors all over the world that have global exposure. Uh, and most climate regulation that's coming through around the world has some kind of um, social human rights dimension to it. So it's growing. Um, we're going to spend the next hour or so talking about how expectations are changing in the investment world around human rights and, and the lessons that are being learned so far from, from the people who are kind of at the forefront of this conversation. And I'm very pleased to introduce those people. Um, Hisaka uh, Furuta, an investment manager at Rosona Res Asset Management. Is it Rosona? Mm -hmm. I know it's just, it's changed and I still used to call it by its old name. Christine Lund Christiansen, head of ESG at P+, which is a Danish pension fund for academics. Um, we've got Anne Lindsay, Responsible Investment Coordinator at the International Transport Workers Federation, uh, and Nina Roth, Head of Active Ownership at Columbia Threadneedle Investments for EMEA and APAC. Welcome to you all. Thanks for joining us. Um, I should say, by the way, we do strive for more gender diversity than this normally. <laughs> but, uh, our, our, token, uh, our token man uh, was sadly taken ill, so uh, apologies for that. Uh, Justine, I'm going to come to you first, if I can. Um, because as a pension fund, you sort of sit at the top of, of the food chain when it comes to these things. Um, so can you just sort of give us an overview of why human rights matters to you from a pension perspective and, and how you're kind of treating it and um, expectations from asset managers and so on? Yeah, sure. Thank you very much. Well, so 
I'm representing uh, an asset owner here on the panel at the top of the, the chain, I heard. Um, so thank you for having me today. Um, well, for us, P+, uh, which is a pen Danish pension fund for academics, um, actually the point of departure of why we work with human rights is that we strive to act in line with the UN guiding principles on human rights. Um, and in order to do so, uh, we need to then um, be very cautious about our, how we work with our business relationships and what risks we have. Um, so that was like the initial driver uh, for this. But now, as Sophie mentioned, the EU regulation is coming in heavily. So today also, it's actually just um, also following the spe specifically the SFDR regulation on um, where we include human rights and assess human rights risks and act on negative impact and in order to promote sustainability factors are also main drivers today. Um, and of course, as some of my colleagues here on the panel will speak to, we do engagement with companies, but also we do uh, engagement or stewardship or use our influence or what we would call it uh, towards then the asset managers. And especially the asset managers in the private markets, we find to be uh, crucial that we have a robust due diligence uh, towards them. Because once we're invested in an asset manager that invests in a fund in a private market, we have these investments for many years and we cannot simply exclude them. So that's like the why uh, we do it. Um, and so what we do um, is that we, um, we do upfront due diligence on the managers and we discuss what we find to be their main risks. And we prioritize also how we work with managers based on what we assess to be uh, a severe impact, uh, high risk areas, controversies, sector, geography. And then it, it varies how deep or specific we go with the managers on human rights aspects um, because we have to prioritize. So that's overall how we do it. Great. Mm -hmm. And Nina, as, a, as someone on the receiving end of this kind of due diligence, as an asset manager, can you tell us a little bit about what it looks like from, from your perspective and what you're doing? Yeah, super. Um, I'm very happy to speak about our engagement and proxy voting efforts uh, in this space. Uh, but just to frame my answer, um, human rights are also int integrated more broadly um, in, in our research work um, in our thematic research work, but also um, pre-investment screening and post-investment monitoring. When I look at um, and our engagement efforts, um, we engage um, equities, uh, corporate fixed income on a one-on-one -on -one basis, but also collaboratively, and, and that is supplemented by public policy engagement also in, in the human rights space. Um, we do engage for insights and improvement, um, and um, human rights and labor standards are one of our two engagement um, themes um, that we gauge along out of, out, out of seven, and we have a dedicated guideline uh, where we outline aspirations for companies around human rights um, and, and, and also labor standards more broadly. Um, we do prioritize our engagement along um, four pillars. Um, um, that is, on one hand, um, priority issuers, where we look at the worst performers in each sector. Um, so you might think, uh, or you will think, uh, rightfully, uh, that um, a, a lot of um, um, issuers with a bad human rights track record um, um, are in, in that bracket. The second pillar is thematic engagement projects. They run two to three years and in industries, cross value chain, cross regions, where we think um, um, topics are uh, relevant to be addressed from a risk and opportunities perspective for the issues we invest in. So currently, uh, we have three um, projects that are linked to human rights engagement, uh, human rights due diligence, uh, that's a cross-sector project. Uh, we look at um, um, social supply chain management and, and audits uh, in these, particularly looking at apparel, retail, and service companies across the globe. Uh, and then lastly, we look at responsible um, artificial intelligence. We also have event-driven engagement, so all collaborative engagement would, would be part of that. Um, all engagement um, um, prior to proxy voting would be figure, figuring there. All controversies. So again, particularly in the controversy bracket, human rights and engagement um, is, is very prevalent. And then lastly, we have strategy and, and fund-specific engagement um, that also links to the SDGs. So again, here you would have um, um, human rights engagement covered. 
all the engagement outcomes are shared with our fundamental research analysts um, and our portfolio managers, so they may influence investment decisions, and they also influence, of course, our proxy voting. And uh, I will very briefly speak about our proxy voting, um, um, which, which is linked um, to, to what I already said. Um, the, the way we structure it is, on one hand, on individual shareholder proposals. Um, so prior to season, we try to align with our fundamental research and investment uh, professionals, uh, like, like portfolio managers on major topics that um, we are seeing in the market. So that might be, for example, racial equity audits, um, rich productive rights, any disclosure linked efforts, um, and um, and then or living wages, for example, and then do um, an, an, a case by case assessment um, for, for all the other um, pr um, portfolios that are coming in. And then in addition to that, we have uh, what we call a social overlay um, for, for voting activities, um, which can then, um, it's, it's a pre-season assessment um, on, on um, linked with certain benchmarks, and I come to that in a second. And um, if names are popping up through that pre-assessment, uh, that may, might result in um, us not supporting management resolutions um, um, that can be on the reports or accounts, uh, but also not supporting individual directors. And the way we're coming up with these names is on one hand, uh, we look at the uh, corporate human rights benchmark um, um, and um, for companies that have uh, performed zero or score zero on embedding and um, respect and human rights due diligence theme. And on the other hand, we look at code of conduct um, of companies to understand whether they have incorporated um, um, code of conduct and supplier code of conduct whether they have incorporated uh, forced and child labor. And if they haven't, in, in addition, we identify a lot of controversies. So evidencing that they, they the not incorporation actually has some consequences, the companies end up on that overlay list. Um, we achieve, like in, in this overlay element, we, we have around um, a high two-digit number of companies that then get put into this automatic vote against management bracket, um, of course potentially challenged by our investment professionals. Can I ask you just, you mentioned a public policy uh, engagement. So are you able to just elaborate a little bit on what that looks like? Because it's, it's probably early days. Yeah. I, would I mean, th there is a mixture, right? So it can be um, in engagement or co consultations that are put out by financial regulators or like the EU um, or, um, on um, certain uh, regulations that they want to put out and get an investor perspective. So we, we respond to that. That is one, one element, okay. for example. Kirsten, can I come back to you a second? Because there was a long list of different topics. We talk about human rights, but there's so much underneath human rights. And sometimes people kind of conflate it with labor rights. But Nina was just talking about AI, racial equity, living wages, child labor. Are there priorities from where you sit about the things that are most pressing or the things that come onto your radar the most often in terms of human rights? Well, I think most often what we see is um, they are typically items that are not covered by local legislation. Right. And most often that's that would be things then in the supply chain, maybe a few steps out, um, like forced labor also I heard over there has been a, a huge topic for us the past year um, with regards especially to the solar panel industry. Mm -hmm. We've been going through our portfolio um, across asset classes to see, because we find that this is uh, the, an example of uh, severe risk and adverse impact um, that we will have to figure out how to, uh, to grab. Is that easy to do, to grab? No, it's definitely not easy to grab <laughs> no. because you, you have this um, potential uh, impact in various uh, ways through uh, direct investments or through managers that invest in private companies that have it in the supply chain or might have it. So it's, it's definitely difficult. Right. Okay. Interesting. Well, maybe we'll come back to that afterwards. Sack, I want to bring you in if I can now, because you're also on the receiving end of, of some of these changing expectations. Can you talk to us a bit about um, the collaborative role? Because I know that that's really what we're, what we're here to talk about is the, the joy of collaboration. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I would like to uh, present some slides from our side. So on this page, uh, these are the lists of the collaborative engagement which we participate in right now. So on the left-hand side, you see ICCR, know the chain uh, engagement um, using the uh, so know the chain benchmark engagement. And in the middle part of the left-hand side, you'll see the PRA advance. So uh, this is the uh, 
initiative which was launched in the Barcelona last uh, conference. And on the right hand side, bottom part, you will see FAIR initiative. Uh, they're dealing with working condition engagement. And on the very bottom part, you will see IAST, APAC, it's, uh, Investors Against uh, Slavery and Trafficking, APAC Collaborative Engagement, uh, which deals with uh, modern slavery uh, reporting requirements in Australia. So um, many, many of the engagements which we participate, uh, the themes are different, like climate change, uh, nature capital, and human rights. But these are the major uh, human rights and social issues related uh, engagements. The target company and the region and the sector differs by each uh, collaborative engagements. Thank you. And what's the advantage of doing right. it value. through these initiatives? Right. Um, so I wanted to uh, highlight some value mm -hmm. because in Japan, compared to the Europe and the US, the Europe and the US investors had long I mean, uh, engagement experiences yeah. with uh, investing companies. So we tend to learn how they set up the collaborative engagement, how they set up the like milestones and questions, and how they coordinate the investor groups. We are learning still on the learning stage of that, and also um, by collaborating, uh, collaborating, engagement, engaging by uh, working groups, it makes us efficient. Uh, come up with an efficient uh, set of questions and milestones. And on the corporate side, I think uh, it's practical or efficient for the corporate also because um, they tend to have one efficient or effective engagement through uh, having questions or having opinions from a diversity, diversified uh, group of uh, people. Um, I think that is... Uh, an advantage, and also by the collaborative engagement, you do the prep meeting, prep engagement meeting, and uh, post meeting. So in the prep meeting, you come up with a certain uh, concrete uh, milestones or questions, and also by doing the post engagement meetings, you get to discuss whether this uh, each engagement was effective, what went right and what went wrong, and we can also discuss about the next step, next step. Uh, question and uh, focusing area by doing that. Okay, so very strategic. Right. Um, can, can you, um, you've just sort of lifted the curtain a little bit on some of the processes. Are there advantages to having, uh, and I will hear more about advance shortly, but certainly Climate Action 100 Plus, which is there, ha has a kind of um, an approach where you team a, an investor from the region or from the country with uh, maybe a, an investor from somewhere else with very large exposure and so on. Is, is, that, is, is that a component of, of advance at the moment? Yeah, you can just... Yeah, oh. Right, okay. It's obviously earlier days than it is for CA100+. Plus. But is there, is there value in that kind of um, teaming up of oh, local investors? Of, with Yes, in terms of the like, Climate Action Round, Plus, maybe this is not relevant to this session, but um, within the Japan target companies, they have uh, one co-lead uh, from Japan and one co-lead from the outside, which is called person coasters. Right. right. In terms of um, advance, it differs, but they have diverse, diverse uh, investor groups. So within our investing, uh, engagement cases, we do have our local right. investors as well. Okay, so that's another useful advantage to it. Um, and I'm going to bring you in if I can. Please uh, stay. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You've been waiting patiently, but the other type of collaboration that's kind of crucial in, in a conversation about human rights is stakeholder engagement, right? And it's another one of those terms that maybe we throw around, but we don't talk very much about what it actually looks like. Um, on the ground, especially. Can you tell us a bit more from from where you sit in this ecosystem. Certainly, and, and we've obviously heard there's a lot of experience on the panel, there's a lot of engagement that's going on. Um, I'm coming at this obviously from a trade union perspective, uh, and I work at the International Transport Workers Federation, which is a global union federation representing some uh, 20 million workers worldwide across the transport industry. So that would include aviation, logistics, road, rail, shipping, dockers. Uh, 
a whole range of men and women who keep us moving and keep our supply chains moving. And um, from our perspective, we're very, we find it very helpful that PRI has put the focus on with advance on human rights. Um, I think you'll all agree that from the conference so far, there have been a whole range of new issues and challenges, all of which are very urgent on the agenda. So advance, I think, is helpful as a reminder that we must ensure that human rights, which for us obviously include labour rights, don't slip off the agenda when we're looking at, for example, climate, biodiversity, and the need to respond urgently. And why is that? Because as we've heard from many other speakers, actually we have to approach ESG in an integrated way and look at issues around inequality and decent work if we want to build uh, resilient uh, business models and, and achieve our uh, climate goals. So I think from our perspective, I wanted to flag up why we think stakeholder engagement through advance can be very helpful. Um, I think for me, there's a paradox, isn't there? We're talking about how can investors, asset managers and asset owners ensure that global rights are respected, but at the same time, we need to engage with companies in a very industry-specific context, looking at how they affect rights through their business practices. And also, we've heard uh, this week about cultural and regional context too. So if the objective of advance is to move from a company having a human rights policy to ensuring that it in respect human rights in its operations, including labour rights, how do we do that? And as trade unions, we see that engagement with stakeholders, for example, with trade unions and workers, is a key ingredient. And why is that? Um, I think primarily from our perspective, because we see um, uh, these labour rights as being enabling rights, uh, enabling workers to organise and to negotiate um, so we're talking about ongoing processes which will take place within the business. Workers themselves are in a position to uh, negotiate and push for living wages, to uh, monitor health and safety, to highlight potential human rights abuses in a preventative way. Um, so that's why I think labour rights are particularly important within that broader human rights framework. Um, but also, as we've heard, um, we have to act collaboratively to have maximum impact. And I think that's where advance is really helpful. Uh, the structure that has been working over the last few months since Barcelona with a, a lead investor uh, and another group of broader group of investors as part of the engagement with specific uh, companies means that we can kind of pool resources. Um, and from the trade union perspective, it's enabled us to highlight where labour rights abuses are going on and the actions that workers want to see the company take that can be fed into the dialogue. So I'll just give one very concrete example of an ongoing case study from this year through Advance, where the Committee on Workers' Capital, the broader network of which I'm part, um, has been highlighting challenges to union organisation at uh, POSCO, the South Korean metal company, um, where the Turkish affiliate labour rights, um, highlighted labour rights violations um, where around 80 workers had been illegally um, uh, uh, sacked because they were organising to form a trade union. And through the advance uh, initiative, we've been able to bring together uh, workers, trade unions and those investors leading the engagement with the company. Um, and from my perspective, I think trade unions can then help to offer a bit of a reality check as to what's happening on the ground. Um, but also, they're not just stakeholders, they are rights holders. And so in this context, the Turkish trade union has been able to highlight to the investors what measures and solutions they think would help. In this case, it's bringing the, the company to the table in a genuine dialogue and a negotiation with the trade union. 
So I think those are very practical ways that we can bring sector-specific knowledge and experience from trade unions, from the worker level, into the high-level dialogue and engagement and the many initiatives uh, that are already going on. Fab. And if you had a magic wand, then, and you could, you could sort of pull one more lever to make it a bit easier for this sort of representation to be effective and, and to move things forward, what, what would you be shooting for at the moment? Oh, uh, it's a great <laughs> question. And I think the trade union movement is at the moment pulling a whole range of levers. So obviously, uh, I think we do think that there needs to be uh, mandatory requirements uh, on human rights due diligence. Um, if we look at the sectors that have been selected for advance, we've got mining and minerals, we've got energy and renewables. Sad to say that some of the labour rights abuses and broader human rights abuses within these sectors are decades old. So there's not going to be one single approach or initiative, it's a combination of working together. Uh, I think uh, the mandatory requirements helps to focus attention. And I think many investors are grappling with what due diligence, for example, in supply chains looks like. Um, but coupled with that, we need access. We need uh, trade unions to be involved in the conversation about what due diligence looks like and to be part of monitoring what's actually changed. And, and that, that can help, I think, in your evaluation processes. So we've got a pretty, a pretty broad, big picture there of, of the situation. So regulation and legislation pushing human rights uh, up the agenda. ASA owners asking for more due diligence for stronger efforts from their managers on, on human rights. Uh, managers then integrating this through screening, proxy voting, policy engagements, corporate engagements, all kinds of, of things. Uh, supply chains are particularly big issue uh, and that I think will be pushed further forward by the regulation that answers we need um, so badly. Um, that is industry specific when it comes to these issues uh, collaboration is essential and trade unions are essential um, this is a good time to stop just to ask if anyone has any questions we're going to move on in a second to what success looks like but I just uh, I just wanted to there is a roving mic somewhere I'm assured although everybody knows my track record with that, so yes uh, there's a gent with his hand up here and the lady with her hand up there uh, and if you could let us know who you are before you ask the question, that would be really useful. Hi, um, my name's um, Chris Hall. I'm from ESG Investor. Thanks to everyone for the uh, um, comments so far. Um, uh, really excellent uh, uh, discussion. Um, I had a question for Nina, actually. Um, she was um, kind of describing um, the, the, the way in which um, Columbia Threadneedle um, looks at um, human rights records of, uh, of companies through the engagement processes, the kind of core, the benchmarking, um, and the kind of circumstances under which a, uh, a vote might, might be triggered at an AGM. Um, but you mentioned also that that can be challenged by investment professionals. So I was just wondering, what were the kind of circumstances under which investment professionals might challenge those automatic votes? Uh, those uh, votes against and, and how is the uh, situation resolved? Yeah, um, um, so we have an escalation process um, and, and the, the circumstances under which they would challenge is that for for, for them and for their particular investment strategy, it would not make sense to ask a certain question or, or, or um, consider a certain aspect um, of a shareholder proposal or um, they have a particularly good view of a certain director and would not want them to be voted against. Um, that, but that then goes through a process of escalation where that portfolio manager um, and the active ownership um, professional um, basically present their case to a group of senior leaders um, um, fr from the investment space. Um, and they, th the senior leaders then take a decision for each region whether they either follow the standard policy or deviate from that. In uh, 2023, we had 14 of these cases globally that got escalated to that group. None of them was human rights related or social related actually. There's another hand up here. Hi, my name is Lisa from MIAG Asset Management. Um, I was wondering if you could share some insights. If you had engagements, you mentioned also the solar panel industry, um, where there are maybe no um, workers union. Um, yeah, could you share some experiences on human rights um, engagements? 
in that sector in that sector can you <laughs> have well, you got any off the top of your head um well i i could say what we're doing with with regards to the stewardship on the asset managers on this topic yeah yeah please so well then we've identified this clearly as a as a crucial potential adverse impact so for all the um asset managers in our portfolio that have uh, these uh, solar panel investments in in the fund we've been having discussions with them on on their supply chain management and um if how they could maybe have uh, uh these supplies from somewhere else or um so that's like how we do it and we've also been looking into there are these numbers of um international initiatives um but to be honest we haven't really found one that we could recommend but uh so we're we're having more a conversation with them and then we need to see some uh the what documentation they have from their due diligence um from the supply chain to to be able to assess the risk how do they generally and i know all asset managers are different but what's the general response when you come to them with something as complex as this are they like oh thanks for flagging it or are they like we're dealing with net zero and everything else <laughs> i think there are there we don't we do not find there is a general response we find that it varies a lot like in some markets they prefer not to speak about it at all and in some markets they have actually done a lot but they don't really then they're not transparent about it um so i think maybe that's the <laughs> right uh yeah. perspectives but usually we find that the asset managers are not transparent about it but some might still be doing something and some oh. might not interesting any more questions at the moment there'll be more chance for questions there's just another one here there'll be more chance at the end and this one there okay this this one here first please because i pointed first and that feels fair and then come back <laughs> <laughs> thank you uh, my name is uh, son lasna i'm from nicredit uh, i would like to hear you uh, your view on this kind of dilemma that we are battling uh, especially with it goes to also the solar industry uh, so uh, obviously in the un guiding principles the the workload of uh, protecting is usually with the country itself but sometimes and this goes especially right with human rights for some reason uh, the country might decide not to protect the human rights could be china could be myanmar um and that creates kind of a dilemma especially when it goes to local companies how actually to well assess if engagement success is at all realistic uh vis-a-vis -vis, uh, doing the UN guiding principle kind of approach saying to the company if the country does not want to protect then it's your job that kind of dilemma uh, if you could shed some light on that anyone with with views on that it's a it's a complex question does has have you come across this dilemma yourselves yeah, yeah. sure I, well i would agree it's definitely a dilemma we see and also the whole thing about the i said um the asset managers and also the companies not being transparent about their potential linkage to uh, forced labors it's also due to if they're transparent in some um countries it it's actually a legal problem for them as well and in Denmark we have this point of departure that we think they should be transparent also about the potential adverse impacts but in other markets it's viewed viewed differently um so we definitely see it as a dilemma and i don't have a one way of handling it to be honest yeah maybe, maybe i can yeah? i can i can add to that so when when we start an engagement in in such a case um the the first step is about finding out the company's position and what it actually has done about like their their human rights due diligence or or supply chain due diligence in in one way or the other um and then trying to understand what their levers are in that particular region in the particular case because that might really vary from industry to industry and then with that information we would um set objectives for engagement um and 
check them on a quarterly basis. And it can absolutely be that then after a certain while, we understand, okay, we, we don't have actually any potential for change for, for that company. And then we, we basically play that back to the, the portfolio managers to then either take a decision on whether they, they keep that risk um, because of various other reasons that, for example, um, it is it might still be in the best economic interest of their underlying clients to remain invested or whether um, they exit um, be because there is no way of, um, of, of change and the risks are too high. There was one more question at the back and then we'll, we're going we're gonna to stop questions for now. Thank you. Uh, Catherine Isabel from PSP Investment, a Canadian pension investor. Quick question for you. So how do you manage the non-net zero risk around the social um, factors in vis-a-vis -vis your own license to operate and the rise of expectation from our different stakeholders over those matters that Ooh. are rising in concern? What do you mean the non-net zero risk? So the fact that it's impossible to have a net zero risk environment over, over human rights uh, controls and processes, especially in certain sensitive sectors as solar panel or things like that. It's so you mean factoring in the yeah, social how do dimension you, to the yeah? How do you manage uh, this existence or the not like we all know it's it's impossible to achieve a net a net zero risk environment on those concerns vis-a-vis mm -hmm. -vis your own license to operate and the expectation of your different stakeholders. Okay. Any anyone want to come in on on that? Saka, do you have any views on the social dimension of of net zero and making sure that you're dealing with that, or anybody else? I know it's a big conversation throughout this conference, but if anyone has any views, well, I, I could say something to it. Well, I, I agree. We we as also in our portfolio we have so many risks. <laughs> so what we do every day is we prioritize also within human rights. So we actually prioritize when we prioritize between uh, companies. We like have this one is um, uh, importance to the portfolio, and the other is like uh, human rights risk, high, low, high, low. And then we try to then get rid of uh, or exclude companies that are not important to the portfolio and who has like high human rights risk. And then we would um, then put our effort in engagement towards the companies that are important for the portfolio and also have some high risk, potential or actual. So that's like the, the point of departure in how we prioritize. Okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, I just wanted to come in on that in that I think we have to have very clear intentions as well. Um, this is where right, understanding, for example, the human rights risks in the supply chains, I think, is an essential step. Um, and almost every business activity in which we engage, there are environmental, social, human rights, potential risks and impacts. But I think it has to be a proactive strategy to manage that rather than, in a sense, like um, writing it off is too hard. I think what we need to see now are new ways of working on a uh, challenges that we know exist in global supply chains and that's where I think the collaboration that PRI is fostering for example in the committee on workers capital PRI is able to put investors in touch with a trade union or help to identify the particular risks linked to operating in a sector or a country so I think nobody at the moment has all the answers um, but we have to go into this with our eyes open and have an intentional um, objective. And let's be honest, the UN guiding principles have been around for over a decade. These are all questions that were being discussed in 2011. Um, and we need to keep coming back to how we can get better at this because um, human rights abuses uh, are still a priority. Uh, and I just wanted to flag up from, for example, ITF's perspective, we're working with companies to help them understand the human rights risks in their transport and logistics supply chains. So uh, we've worked and we've come up with our guidance, which is specifically looking at this. Often this is invisible workers, transport workers, unknown risks that perhaps until the COVID pandemic, people weren't aware of how uh, seafarers' rights could then uh, impact on global supply chains. So there is a lot of expertise out there. There are not easy answers, but we have to proactively look for solutions. 
I mean, did you have something? Yeah, just maybe to to, to round the, that off yeah. from the asset management perspective. I think there is uh, no no risk environment on environment, on social, on governments, but also on governance, but also clearly on on the financial side. So mm -hmm. it is, as everyone said, it's about understanding them, mitigating them, and then at some point accepting them. And that can be through engagement, it can be through reweighting, and it can be done through divestment. Fab. And that brings us on to the, the next thing that I want to talk about, which is how you measure the success of all of this. A nice, easy question to, to finish us off. Hisaka, I know that you have some thoughts on this and you have another slide, so maybe you can kick slide. us off. Love his slide. Thank you. Um, so I've put down uh, two engagement cases. Um, the company ha was kind enough to give ask permission to represent the name. And on the left-hand side, we have we are presenting the case of the Spanish uh, utilities company in the advanced uh, initiative. On the, uh, the right-hand side, this is the uh, case of the Japanese listed companies uh, named ASICS. Um, this is a listed company on apparel and footwear. And uh, yes, the, using no the chain benchmarks. So uh, there were some how do you say, um, milestones like governance and commitments and purchasing practices, grievance, re remediation, and traceability, and so on. So uh, it's still a box taking because um, for the social issues, you are still not able to uh, compare each other by uh, calculating them into economic financial value. But still, uh, this could be a step of the milestone in terms of engagement. And I think Noda Chain is currently working on um, coming up with a new assessment next spring. But uh, during that time, on the right-hand side, ASICS has made some progress in terms of uh, information disclosure. So uh, first, uh, they have disclosed that uh, their doing the assessment for the tier one suppliers factories. And on the second part, uh, they have clearly disclosed sustainability frameworks and differentiating the planet and the people pillar. And it's on the fourth area that the company has said material issues, disclosed them, and human rights in the supply chain is uh, set as a high priority issues among the company. And in terms of the left-hand side, uh, Iberdrola case, um, we, the first engagement uh, was commenced in September, and the major uh, engagement issues, until that time, we did not have a clear framework within the advance, so we were uh, referring to the BHRC uh, assessment, but uh, maybe the first uh, very initial engagement issue was human uh, confirming on the human rights policy and supplier engagements and grievance uh, area. And maybe it might change, but the next topics uh, topics for the next round of engagement could be risk assessments and health and safety uh, collective bargaining. Thank you. So the, uh, the one of the keys to measuring success is, is defining it up front by the looks of, of it. So you've, you've, yeah. there's a framework coming through in advance that will allow mm -hmm. that, that kind of initial step working out what you're actually trying to achieve. And then uh, progress on disclosure is, is easier to, with the ACES case, easier to sort of quantify and measure. You can actually see when there's more disclosure coming through. So it's one of those easy places to, to measure engagement success. Um, I wondered if any of the other panelists want to step in either on anything that Isako has just mentioned or in, in your experiences of uh, either case studies or points around data, metrics, quantification, uh, challenges around identifying whether you've been successful on human rights at the moment. I know this is an, uh, an early stage in the agenda, but um, uh, maybe, uh, and you look... You yeah, look I'll just, uh, I suppose, <laughs> finish off the case study example that I quoted that had been a, um, an example of uh, collective and collaborative engagement through advance. Um, uh, as I mentioned, that's very much ongoing. 
uh, the data that the trade union and the local experts in Turkey were able to uh, provide through the stakeholder engagement have fed into an engagement meeting with the company, I think, last month. Um, so we're not there yet, but certainly in terms of the union in Turkey, the outcome they would like to see is that a collective bargaining agreement has been negotiated. So moving from uh, a first engagement to an, a, a, a lasting and sustainable dialogue with an outcome. Um, and I think it's really helpful that PRI is thinking about how to move from policies to impacts. Um, and then also very interesting to see the, uh, the previous slide where, for example, health and safety metrics, again, for, for our doc workers, that's huge and that's really important. And then we're seeing uh, policies translating into improvement in working people's lives, which I think is our goal here. Fabulous. Nina, did you... Yeah, I, I, I can. If, yeah, yeah, uh, please okay. do. Uh, super. Please um, do. So um, I mentioned that for, for our engagement, once we've done our research and, and collected all the insights, that we then set um, engagement objectives where we want to see improvement from the company. Um, so we put that in a database we have and then engage on the back of this, that objective uh, and record on a quarterly basis um, um, progress or no progress on that. So an objective could be, for example, uh, a company to develop a human rights due diligence framework or a process. Um, or policy even. And so once we have then seen that the process has been developed or a policy has been published, we would record um, the objective as completed and a milestone. Um, but here, uh, then it, it becomes interesting because we have a lot of clients who actually want the metrics output in, in the, on that very high level uh, way. Like how many companies did you cover? How many objectives did you complete? Uh, how many milestones did you achieve? Fine. But actually, for an investment process, that is not really helpful. So there we need a way more detailed narrative um, and, and what that actually means for the company, how, how it is um, in comparison to other industry peers. Um, um, and where, whether we see it's actually progressing or not. So the, it needs way more detail. It needs this narrative. And that obviously also then is a challenge for how, how it can be scaled um, um, be, because it, it can't be um, with like, if we have a, a large team, but um, it's nowhere near enough um, to do that for all issuers all the time. So uh, any solutions, very welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Kirsten, did you have any anything that you wanted to add and what success looks like from you or experiences you've had? I think for the, uh, the way we approach engagement with uh, listed companies, it's quite similar. Um, with regards to our stewardship on asset managers, we also internally, when we do our upfront due diligence on managers, we rate them with regards to their management system. So you all have a number in our system. And we also, uh, um, considering then the risk of the investments in the fund, we uh, then have one, two things that we write down for our investment committee that we will follow up on um, on the asset managers, which could be uh, supply chain uh, management. And then we, um, then that's how we monitor them also on specific objectives. Okay, interesting. Okay, so there's lots of different uh, ways of, of doing this. Is Before I hand back over to a couple of questions, if anyone has them, does anyone else have anything to add on this on this issue for an audience who kind of wants to understand how they get their head around this, who uh, is it early days for everybody involved, but is there any other final reflections on you? Uh, yeah, just, I suppose, would be uh, the point that there's a lot of tools and expertise out there already. And if people aren't already aware of the Committee on Workers' Capital uh, expectations document that they've prepared in terms of freedom of association and what uh, trustees, for example, could be asking asset managers to... To, to deliver um, that sets out some some very practical steps and standards um, and likewise I mean I think we see the CWC as being a really useful hub if um, people there who are grappling with issues whether in relation to particular industries or supply chains transport services manufacturing want to be in, put in touch with a union with a, an affiliate in a particular country or region CWC is very happy to provide that convening role. Thank you. Anything else before we hand over to questions? No, fab. Any more questions from, from anyone? We're going to have a presentation on advance in a few minutes, but I just want to check whether anybody has any anything. Off the, there's a gentleman here. And I'm, I don't think anything is coming through on this fancy 
this fancy thing here. Um, but uh, I'm, it seems to be saying no. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, Rod Pickett, Maritime Union of Australia. Um, thank you for the panellists. Uh, very interesting discussion. Um, I'm wondering why uh, we need to turn a human right uh, and that, when we think of human rights, most governments, and I, I think certainly I would think the, the majority of governments from which the people who are represented at this conference come from would have signed up to most of the world's human rights conventions, uh, certainly in the labour space. So I'm wondering why we think we need to turn a human right into a financial value to be able to determine whether a human right, you know, it, it, why that has to be the measure of how we assess as to whether a human right or where it sits in the sort of risk spectrum and why we can't design some measures as we have done in the E space so effectively, why can't we design some S measures that the, the, the world could, the globe could agree on? They wouldn't be that difficult. For example, the proportion of workers who are covered by a collective agreement. Why shouldn't we have a, an objective? By 2050, every worker should be covered by a collective agreement. That would give us some goals to work towards. And then we set some, some pathways towards that, a transition program, as we are doing in the e-space. Because I feel that we, I've been coming to these conferences for quite a long time. And I don't feel that we're, you, you look out in this, the world of work and there are just so many indicators that the workforce is, being, their rights are being violated across just about every measure you can think of. So I'm just asking that question. Is there sort of a, uh, I know it's a big question, but is there <laughs> any sort of question. response to that? So a, tra a transition strategy where there's an overarching global end goal on human rights the way there is for net zero. I would say though, that most investors still only talk about net zero through financial terms, unfortunately. So they may have the end goal, but they're still not really allowed to talk about it for anything other than impact and uh, or financial, financial terms, most of them. Any thoughts on this? Do we need this kind of uh, 2050 target on human rights in order to galvanize around it? Or, <laughs> or is the UNGPs enough? <laughs> I think it sounds as a good idea. I'm not sure exactly how to uh, yeah, <laughs> to define it. Put yourself forward to organize. This. Yeah, <laughs> but actually, what we're doing in the European Union now is we have we're um, um, reporting on their principal adverse indicators that have like indicators on percentage of portfolio aligned with the OECD M and E guidelines. So, but it's still quite difficult to compare because there are different definitions of what that looks like. Um, yeah. Yes. Um, there's. Uh, have we got time for one more question? I'm going to guilt chip. One quick question because there's a <laughs> hand up over there and I can never resist. And then, and then we're going to pass over. Hi, Gemma Corrigan from Federated Hermes. Uh, wonderful panel. I would love to hear a little bit more about how you're looking at conflict risk countries as the numbers continue to grow by the day and how that's factored in. I know Columbia Thread and Needle is doing amazing work here, but wondering, you know, how can we push this forward as part of the advance initiative more widely? Tricky one to ask you to answer quickly, but can you, can you give us a brief uh, overview? I mean, we incorporate conflict risk management in our engagement program. Um, we work closely with Iris Foundation and, and the Conflict Risk Network there, um, and, and it's a like it's a risk-based um, uh, development. So whenever a new conflict um, is is arising, uh, we we look at the companies um, who are exposed to it and and try to like understand the risks and and then work with them to really. Yeah, move either to an exit from that particular conflict, actually, if that, that is a case, or move away um, from, um, from them um, as, as an investment uh, target. But there, I mean, it's very more nuanced, but I, th I think it's, uh, it's very difficult to answer in <laughs> maybe, zero seconds. <laughs> when we, apologies, maybe when the breakout happens, you can come together and, and swap some more. Um, I'm going to close. I want to say a massive thank you to, to the audience for, for attending and for asking fantastic questions and a particularly massive uh, thank you to our panellists for talking us through that very complex area. So thank you and I will hand back over to our presenters.
Cheers. Thank you so much, Sophie. And thanks to our excellent panel. Um, yeah, evidently some really complex questions uh, that we hope that Advance can help uh, all of us grapple with. And I think one of the things that we've tried to do with Advance is really bringing a diversity of perspectives and a diversity of stakeholders to try and, and grapple with these complex questions and help us try to put together like a framework that's actually helpful um, in tracking progress against the objectives we've, we've set. So we're going to be very quick because I'm realizing we're what stands behind uh, between you and the lunch. So I'll just quickly run through uh, the framework. It's a trailer, if you will. Uh, the document will be published in the next couple of weeks. So hopefully that will entice you in reading the whole document. So just in terms of the goals um, of the framework is really, as I was just saying, to try and assess the progress of the initiative against the objectives that we've set. It's also aiming to help us inform the strategic direction of the initiative. And it's gonna be very much of a kind of work in progress, if you will, or an iterative process in the sense that we will continue to keep updating the document as we see that, like, to make sure that it remains fit for a purpose, basically. In terms of the design principles uh, that we've used for this document, we made sure that it was based and aligned with the objectives of Advanced. We also try to make sure that we were relying solely on publicly available information, trying to use frameworks and international standards that stakeholders and investors recognize and use, and also that it would be a framework that would be applicable across sectors. So in terms of the framework itself, it's for now divided in three parts. We don't exclude that, you know, it grows to include more parts uh, as we develop other work streams. But for now, we're looking at monitoring investor activities and efforts within the initiative, looking at assessing the company performance on human rights of the engagement focused companies, and also looking um, in the future to monitor the developments related to our sector level engagement work. So I'll just briefly cover the investor stewardship efforts and activities part. So this is really to try and, um, and track the levels of participation of investors and try to somewhat demonstrate what we know is very hard to, to, to demonstrate, but the kind of causality between engagement and uh, improvement uh, of the company's like uh, performance on human rights. So we this will be contributing to the broader like engagement data that the PRI collects. It will also facilitate participants' accountability and the initiative level transparency. It will help us build a narrative and get case studies. Uh, that's more for yeah our own benefit and hopefully yours when you read the progress report. In terms of uh, the three elements that are here on the slides, the first one is, as was mentioned during the panel, um, these engagement strategies that each investor working group are developing. So we'll be tracking uh, how these are being implemented and the tools and tactics that investors are using, um, including you know, possible escalation procedures where needed. In terms of the second, we'll, we'll be, again, tracking investor participation and commitment levels. So that will be through an annual participant survey, but also through the PRI internal tracking. Uh, we'll be also tracking what uh, Anne was referring to, i.e. Um, the stakeholder engagements that investors may take part to um, and any other way that they might seek to contribute to the objectives of the initiative. In terms of the last bit, the investor human rights commitment, uh, you might be familiar with the advanced participant in terms of reference and requirements. So we're asking investors participating in the engagement to have their own human rights policy and to develop their own human rights due diligence process to really walk the talk on these issues. So we will be monitoring uh, that this is actually happening. And on this note, I will hand over to my colleague, Nikolai. Yeah, thanks, Navila. And hi, everyone. I'm Nikolai Peterson from the PRI's human rights team. Um, so, yeah, in terms of the second aspect of the uh, assessment framework, we focus on company performance. Uh, and our main reference point here is the company expectations that we've set out in the advanced uh, investor statement. Um, and here we focus on uh, UN guiding principles implementation. We've heard about the importance of this framework. It's the recognized international standard. It's increasingly the template as well for regulation in many juris jurisdictions. 
The second aspect is on responsible political engagement. This is important to ensure that the target companies we deal with align their activities in the in the political realm, in, uh, including through uh, um, industry associations uh, for maximum impact. Uh, and the third aspect is progress relative to severe issues. We've heard about this concept of severity, but this is dealing with the issues that uh, are the most severe for people impacted. So in order to do this, again, we have three components. We make it easy, we work in threes. Uh, the first aspect is tracking uh, company performance relative to minimum standards. Uh, and we do this through the World Benchmarking Alliance uh, Social Transformation Benchmark. Uh, they uh, have a lot of overlap with our goals. So they focus uh, as well on Ewing Guiding Principles implementation. They have a, a particular section on, on uh, decent work, um, uh, labor rights. Uh, these are important for all sectors. and. Uh, the gentleman who asked the question on collective bargaining will be happy to know that that's part of it. Um, the uh, second aspect is on allegations and controversies. And here we have two sources. The first one is the Business and Human Rights uh, Resource yeah. Center. They track allegations of companies around the world um, against any stakeholder groups, um, including on attacks against human rights defenders, uh, lawsuits and so forward. Uh, the second uh, source is the OECD national contact points. Uh, for those of you not familiar with those, those are mechanisms in OECD countries that track allegations, uh, complaints against companies that are not adhering to the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises, which has a human rights uh, section uh, to it. And these two sources are really good because they, they not, it's not a question of only like uh, uh, going to zero uh, issues, but it's a question about how companies deal with it, so on the due diligence. Uh, the third one is progress uh, relative to uh, objectives. And this is what we've been speaking about. There's in investor groups setting strategies and targets for each uh, target companies. And we want to track that we actually meet those uh, that we said this can be on governance and process, but also on outcomes for people, importantly. Um, a few words on uh, sector developments. Uh, this is uh, where we would set uh, more goals for system change. Um, it's important to say this is very much work in progress because the next step in advance is that we'll be doing work on sector strategies. And we need to do that first before we can set some clear goals, of course, for sector developments as well. Uh, but we'll do this through a very inclusive process with our, with our uh, investor participant, target companies, our committees that we work with of experts as well as, as important stakeholders. So I think lastly, just to say in terms of timeline, um, assessment framework is expected to be released uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, so look out for that. Uh, then the next step is our first baseline on company performance, which will happen in Q1 24. And then the first ro report in 2025. The first full report is 2026. This is where we will also include more information on the sector improvement uh, and public policy. Uh, and I should say, we, we of course recognize, we've, we've talked about the challenges, uh, there are some imperfections in social data markets. So as Nabila said, we'll look to review this based on learnings within the initiative, uh, but also uh, developments in the external uh, environment. Uh, we have, for example, given input on the last ISSB consultation, calling for a global standard uh, on corporate disclosures on social and human rights issues. And these are the types of improvements that can help us, of course, track uh, this type of work as well. And with that, I'll hand back to Nabila. Thanks a lot, Nikolai. And yeah, just a, a quick word to, to wrap up. Uh, a big thank you again to our panel, to our excellent moderator, Sophie, um, my colleague Nikolai, and to everyone uh, of you for coming. So yeah, please do come and engage with us and tell us your thoughts and, and if you have any more questions. Uh, just for participants and endorsers of Advance, a reminder that we have a meet and greet. If you want to come and say hi during the lunch break, we'll be in the room across the hall, Wakashiba, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so yeah, thanks a lot, everyone. And again, a big applause to the panel.